In three years of being together, my girlfriend still couldn't forget her first love. There was a locked room in her house, a promise she kept for her first love. As long as he returned, there would always be a place for him in her home. For him, she had repeatedly left me behind. The last time, I only left her a breakup message before disappearing without a trace. I didn't hate him, because compared to her, I wasn't any better. She began searching for me everywhere. Finally, in the cemetery, she discovered the truth behind everything. With red eyes, she pointed at the black and white photo of someone who looked 80% like her and questioned me. Joseph, tell me, who do you think of every time you look at me? Chapter 1 On Roxana's birthday, I brought a few of her friends home to prepare a birthday surprise for her. As the party reached its peak, everyone cheered for us to kiss. Roxana, you have to cherish such a considerate boyfriend. Roxana looked at me, her eyes shining brilliantly, and slowly leaned towards me. I lowered my head to meet her, and as our friends cheered, just as the kiss was about to happen, the door suddenly swung open. A man, soaked to the skin, stood at the entrance. Roxana froze. I turned toward the door and saw a face that looked about 60% like mine. Roxana. He called my girlfriend's name softly. Affectionate. Familiar. Roxana was stunned for a moment, and when she came to her senses, her face had already changed. Why are you drenched? Hurry up and go to the room to change clothes. Our friends reacted faster than I did, greeting him naturally. Marco. Why did you suddenly come back? Had enough fun? The men stood there, startled, showing a faint smile. Long time no see. Roxana's gaze stayed on him the whole time, not sparing even a glance for me. I wanted to ask who he was. Before I could say a word, Marco headed straight upstairs, to the room that had always been locked. The room Roxana had repeatedly emphasized I must never go near. Marco, without hesitation, pulled out a key and effortlessly unlocked it. Chapter 2 When Marco came out again, he had already changed his clothes and sat naturally in the empty seat by the dining table. Our friends, already drunk. Casually placed their hands on Marco's shoulder. Marco, stay longer this time. After all, Roxana's house will always have a room for you. How lucky, to always have someone as your solid support. Why don't you two just hurry up and get married? Roxana lightly coughed. She moved closer to me, trying to break the awkwardness. Joseph, thank you so much for celebrating my birthday today. The scent of Lily of the Valley surrounded me, yet I felt a chill all over my body. I had always known that Roxana had an unforgettable first love. Marco. When Roxana's company was first founded, Marco quit his high-paying job at a foreign company to decisively support her. Even now, after Marco had been gone for several years, Roxana's friends still treated him with affection. They laughed and reminisced about old times. Their camaraderie clear. I picked up my chopsticks, took some food, placed it in my mouth, but I couldn't taste anything. Chapter 3. Their celebration, which belonged entirely to them, lasted until 10 o'clock in the evening. By the time it ended, it was raining heavily outside. In the end, only the three of us were left inside the house. Roxana's face was flushed red from the alcohol, and her head leaned affectionately on Marco's shoulder. I, her legitimate boyfriend, was like air at that moment. I'll take you to the hotel. I'm not leaving. Marco's voice was cold. That room is mine. You said so. No matter what, there will always be a room for me in your home. I felt like an insignificant bystander, ignored by both of them. Roxana, speechless, looked to me for help. Let him stay. The rain outside is getting worse. Just for one night. Okay. Roxana glanced at me, her eyes flickering, her face showing a hint of apology. Joseph, I'm sorry. I pressed my lips together and went upstairs, stepping past them. Chapter 4. That night, I didn't sleep well. The heavy rain continued through the night, and a sudden thunderclap woke me up with a start. Instinctively, I reached out to hold the person beside me, but my arms found only emptiness. All I touched was coldness. A sliver of light came through the crack in the door. I opened it slightly and peered outside. The living room was brightly lit. Marco, wearing an apron, brought out a bowl of noodles, placing it on the coffee table as wisps of steam rose. He looked just like the men of the house. I saw the tender smile on his lips, and his voice was soft. You're still the same. Whenever thunder wakes you, you get scared and need someone with you to feel safe. Roxana stood nearby, smiling. Marco embraced her from behind. I clearly saw Roxana's body stiffen for a moment but she didn't push him away. The warm light in the living room fell upon them, leaking an inexplicable sense of intimacy, like a pair of lovers no outsider could ever come between. Chapter 5 I met Roxana when I was 22. After graduation, I joined her company. My desk was right in front of her office, and when her door wasn't fully closed, I would steal glances through that small gap, looking at that face, the one that had appeared countless times in my dreams, a face that was 70% similar. They really looked so alike especially when she smiled. 
the dimples at the corners of her mouth. Later, my colleague Olivia noticed. When she pressed the cold coffee against my face, I was startled. I turned around and met her eyes, Joseph. She smiled and handed me the coffee, her tone light, as if joking, don't fall for Roxana. Her heart belongs to someone. I blinked. She leaned in closer. Gossiping, Roxana has an unforgettable first love. I'm not sure how long they were together, but it seems they met during their school days. When the company was just starting, they were still together. He would occasionally bring Roxana food at work. Once, during a meeting, Roxana got a call saying he was sick. She left immediately. Someone so dedicated to work, leaving everything for her boyfriend. So romantic, isn't it? Holding the coffee, I asked softly, and then, then they broke up. I don't know the details, but Roxana still seems to think about him. There's even a photo of him on her desk. Olivia shrugged and smiled. I guess her first love hasn't moved on either. Two people who love each other but can't be together. Sounds like something out of a novel. I was stunned for a moment by her words. Just then, Roxana's office door opened, and her secretary came out, Joseph. Roxana wants to see you. When I entered, Roxana was reading a document. Seeing me, she looked up and smiled. Two small dimples appeared at the corners of her mouth. My gaze fell on a framed photo on her desk, and I stared at it. Olivia's regretful expression fresh in my mind. Joseph, will you be my boyfriend? Roxana suddenly spoke. My thoughts were interrupted, and I instinctively replied, Okay. When I regained my composure. I met Roxana's gaze. She was holding the document, looking at me, her eyes like a calm sea. Then she smiled again, a mixture of gentleness and acceptance. My heart suddenly exploded with emotion. All I could hear was the loud beating of my heart. It was the first time since the person died that I felt alive again. Chapter 6 I was restless and unable to sleep, waking up with a dull headache. Instinctively, I reached for my phone to check the time, but when I opened my eyes, I saw Roxana's smiling face. Her eyes curved and the dimples at the corners of her lips were faint. My heart skipped a beat, and the wound from last night's key still faintly ached. Roxana gently leaned into my arms, her voice soft. Joseph, the light and fresh scent of Lily of the Valley surrounded me once again. As Roxana's hand rested on my waist, she sighed again. Why don't you ever get angry? You must want something from me. I lowered my gaze and turned over to hold her. My forehead rested against her heart, and I sighed softly. I don't want your money. I don't want your love either. Roxana. I just want to see you. Just seeing you. Is enough. Chapter 7. As I left the house, I noticed that Marco's room wasn't locked. Roxana subtly blocked my view, cupping my face and planting a kiss on me. I swallowed the question I wanted to ask. The weather forecast showed half sun and half clouds, but by the time I was about to finish work, it had suddenly turned into a heavy downpour. Roxana didn't come to the office today. I sent her a message, asking if she was free. Can you come pick me up at the office? The message remained unanswered and by the time I was nearly finished with the project on my computer, the chat window still showed only the green bubble of my sent text. I packed up my things and headed downstairs. The rain was coming down so hard that it bounced off the ground, splashing onto my pants. The wind blew, chilling my legs. Thunder roared, accompanied by flashes of lightning that suddenly tore across the sky. Startled, I took two steps back. The scene from yesterday overlapped with the present, reminding me, Marco is afraid of thunder. It had been over an hour since I sent the message, and Roxana had never taken this long to reply before. I dialed her number. The phone rang for about half a minute before someone picked up, but it wasn't Roxana who answered. The male voice on the other end was lazy and relaxed. Hello. A cold gust of wind made me sneeze. Where's Roxana? Marco hesitated for a moment before saying, She's making ginger soup. I got caught in a bit of rain on my way back. The rain was getting heavier. I suppressed the growing unease in my chest and calmly asked, can you have her come pick me up at the office? I didn't bring an umbrella. There was a brief silence on the other end before Marco said, Sorry, I'm a little scared. I'll let her come after the thunder stops. It felt like our roles had suddenly been reversed. For a moment, I couldn't tell who was Roxana's boyfriend. Could you pass her the phone, please? Marco put the phone on speaker and called out, Roxana, your boyfriend says he didn't bring an umbrella. Can you go pick him up? After that shout, there was silence, followed by the sound of shuffling. Marco then added quietly, not to me, but I don't want you to go. Another awkward silence. Finally, it seemed like Roxana took the phone. She sighed softly. Joseph, I'm sorry. I'll come get you later. Wait for me at the office. The call ended. The damp weather brought up a lot of bad memories. And even the old scars on my arms seemed to throb with pain. In this endless rainstorm, I suddenly realized that I couldn't wait for Roxana anymore. Chapter 8. I waited until late at night. Long after everyone had left the office before the person picking me up finally arrived. It wasn't Roxana. 
A familiar car stopped at the company's entrance. The door opened, and I saw Anna's face, Roxana's friend. Anna and I weren't particularly close. After getting in the car, I thanked her, my hands and feet cold as I leaned against the door. The cold wind had already left my head feeling foggy. We drove for a while before Anna suddenly spoke. She can't let him go. I looked up, meeting her eyes in the rearview mirror. My mind still cloudy. Roxana asked me to come get you. She didn't come herself because she's with Marco. Right. I didn't know how to react. Instinctively trying to smile, you figured it out. Anna chuckled. After years of on and off entanglement, they should have broken up long ago. Her eyes met mine in the rearview mirror. Her red lips slightly pursed. I hesitated, then asked. Then why aren't they together? Because Marco has a thorn in his heart. Roxana made enemies when she started her business. And they took their revenge on Marco that day. He was delayed and didn't make it in time to see his mother one last time. He stuck with that feeling, torn between love and hate, unable to move on, and Roxana owes him. She'll always feel guilty towards him. So, do you understand? Her tone was calm, like a sharp blade, silently cutting into my flesh. You'll never come between them. I said nothing and looked away. I watched the cars streaming by outside and the rain trickling down the windows. But what I was really thinking about was that day. Not long after I started at the company. I closed a big deal, and my colleagues joked that I should treat everyone to dinner. Roxana happened to walk by, the company had a good atmosphere, so one of my colleagues boldly asked if she was going. Roxana looked over at me, her eyes curving into a smile, I met her gaze. Everyone had just been joking, knowing that Roxana didn't usually get involved in personal matters, but she looked at me, her smile like a breeze in spring, and for the first time, she said, sure, my heart skipped a beat for no reason. Later, Roxana paid for the meal. I happened to run into her as she was paying at the front desk. I'll transfer you the money. Roxana blocked my hand and said softly. No need. But that's not fair. Roxana. We agreed I would treat. I reached to unlock my phone. And Roxana looked down at me. Her eyes betraying a bit of tenderness. Then you can treat me next time. I looked up. Startled. Meeting her gaze. Which was clouded with a distant haze. Her eyes were on me. But it felt like she wasn't really seeing me. She smiled mischievously. I hesitated and said. Okay. I was all too familiar with Roxana's gaze, seeing through me to someone else, I knew, but it didn't matter. Chapter 9 Later, Roxana admitted that it was all premeditated that day, she used the opportunity to ask me out, after we started dating, she curled up in my arms, laughing like a little fox, and said, the moment you agreed that day, I knew you wouldn't escape from the palm of my hand, Joseph, she said, the moment I saw you, I liked you. Chapter 10 By the time Anna's car reached the building. The rain had lightened significantly. She opened her umbrella and helped me out of the car, walking me to the door. Oh, by the way, if you and Roxana really break up, it might be awkward to keep working at her company. You can always come to me. She pulled a business card out of her pocket. I reached out and took it. Are you trying to steal me away? Anna's expression was calm and straightforward, setting everything else aside. Your work skills are exceptional. No matter where you go, people would be fighting to hire you. I'm just reserving you in advance. Before I could respond, Roxana's voice suddenly came from behind, sounding a bit cold. He won't be going. Caught trying to steal a friend's employee, but it didn't bother me, because I wasn't the one feeling awkward. Anna just smiled, said nothing in reply, and got back in her car. Roxana grabbed my wrist, her nails digging into my skin. My hands and feet were freezing, except for the warmth where she held me. The throbbing vein at my temple pulsed painfully, and my head was splitting. I looked at Roxana and spoke seriously. Let's break up. No. She rejected it immediately without even thinking. Roxana's face darkened, her brows furrowing. Is this because of Marco? He's leaving tomorrow. You don't need to do this because of him. Her voice faded in and out. My head was pounding like it was about to explode, and I didn't have the energy to argue with her anymore. Just before I lost consciousness, I saw a blurry figure rushing toward me. So familiar. I instinctively called out. Ali. Chapter 11. Maybe it was the rain and the cold wind. My health had never been good and I came down with a fever all at once. The next day when I woke up, I heard Roxana on the phone. Sorry, something came up today. He's sick. I need to take care of him. Sleepiness washed over me again, and I drifted back into unconsciousness. The towel on my forehead was changed by someone. I don't know when I woke up again. It was thirst that woke me. My throat was so dry it hurt. The towel on my forehead felt dry, and the fever had drained all my strength. I tried to call out for Roxana, but after struggling for a while, I couldn't make a single sound. She wasn't in the room. A glass of water was on the edge of the bedside table. I struggled to sit up and reach for it. My limbs felt weak, and just as I reached the edge of the bed, the blanket slipped out from under me. I knocked over the glass, 
and my body hit the floor hard. Everything hurt like I had fallen apart, but no one came to help me. My mind, feverish and delirious, started to wander. Then she appeared, a face that looked 80% like Roxana's, with the same dimples at the corners of her mouth when she smiled. She smiled and called me, Joseph. She said, you have to live well. I wanted to call out her name, but my throat was so dry and cracked that I couldn't form a single syllable. Alicia, don't go. Alicia. Chapter 12. When I woke up, I was in the hospital, and my fever had gone down a bit. I opened my eyes to see the white ceiling, and four drip, and Roxana, seeing me awake, her furrowed brow eased slightly, and she poured me a glass of water. The sharp pain in my throat finally subsided a little. Joseph, you had a really high fever this time. Her expression was strange, but her voice was still soft. When I came back and saw you weren't in bed, how did you end up falling off? I didn't say anything. Her gaze fell on the hand with the four drip, and she spoke softly again. Joseph, your hand. Why is it covered in scars? I lowered my eyes. The crisscrossing scars on my arm curled like ugly worms. I avoided the topic and asked her instead, where did you go? I clearly heard her say she'd stay home to take care of me. She was silent for a moment, something suddenly came up at the company. Liar. I had actually overheard everything. On Marco's first night back, he whined until she agreed to accompany him to a nightclub. The date was set for today. You called Marco. Roxana froze. I stared at her intently, but she didn't move. I brought it up again, let's break up. No. Her rejection was immediate, without hesitation. She grabbed my other hand, the one without the four, gripping it tightly. Joseph, we're not breaking up, and what about Marco? My expression remained calm. He's getting married. Roxana's voice was stiff. His parents arranged a match for him. They're a good fit, and the wedding date is already set. He only came back to visit, and he's leaving today to go back and get married. Roxana's expression was like a sea shadowed in gloom, impossible to fully read, but I could clearly see a hint of red at the corner of her eyes. I had the sinking feeling that I played an unflattering role in this story, like the villain standing between true love. I knew I should have been angry, but looking at Roxana's face, all my anger dissipated at once. I sighed. I didn't bring it up again. Chapter 13. After that day, Marco seemed to disappear from my life for good. The locked room was sealed again, as if it had never been opened. Roxana and I went back to the way we were before, but locking something away doesn't mean it's gone forever. One day, the matching key will still open that door. I ran into Marco while I was on a business trip. I knew he didn't really care about me as long as he was around. He would always be Roxana's first priority. He didn't need to look at me directly to defeat me. While I was having dinner at the hotel, he suddenly appeared and sat down uninvited across from me. I was a little surprised. What a coincidence. Marco smiled faintly. It's not a coincidence. I found out about your trip from Roxana and came specifically to see you. His gaze rested on my face, slightly distant. At first glance, we do look quite similar. I knew he was talking about me and him, but I said nothing. Marco wasn't bothered by my silence. He met my eyes. Do you love Roxana? I remained silent. He smiled again. I've held on to resentment, unable to let her go. So I keep torturing both of us. Since breaking up with me, Roxana hasn't been with anyone else. When I heard she was with you, I was a bit surprised. Then they showed me your photo. Marco's eyes gleamed, and a hint of satisfaction crossed his face, more than the fact that she found a replacement. What pleases me even more is that she'll never let go of me. He smiled with a proud and arrogant expression, his gaze filled with the confidence of someone who knows they are favored. So I've decided I'm not letting her go. Joseph, I'm going to win her back. Chapter 14 I returned from the business trip four days later. When Roxana came to pick me up at the airport, she even brought my favorite dessert. Feeling a bit exhausted, I placed it aside. Roxana didn't mind. She looked down at me with a smile. Joseph, how about we go on a trip? Just the two of us. I'll give you some time off, and we can go out and see. Before she could finish, her phone rang suddenly. I clearly saw the caller's name, Marco. Roxana instinctively looked at me, and I averted my gaze, avoiding eye contact as I reached for my headphones but she grabbed my hand before I could. The next second, she answered the call and put it on speaker. Marco's voice came from the other side, Roxana, I'm getting married. On the 8th of this month, can you come? Roxana's eyes were locked on mine. I lowered my gaze, hiding the emotions in my eyes. After a long pause, I heard her say, okay. Chapter 15. Marco's wedding was something Roxana and I attended together. I initially planned to go to the office, but she was unusually firm. Joseph, you're my boyfriend a boyfriend, or just a second-rate replacement. I didn't ask her, because we were both equally flawed. Marco's wedding was lively, with a lot of people attending, and the venue was beautifully decorated. As I sat down, 
I overheard people at the neighboring table discussing the bride. You don't know. Marco really loves her. He personally designed the entire wedding and supervised every single detail. I pressed my lips together, turning my head to meet Roxana's smiling eyes. Her smile was mischievous, as if she had overheard their conversation too. Joseph, what kind of wedding do you like? I hadn't thought about it. Weddings and the future. For me, they had always been an unknown void. There was a time when I thought that as long as the person I loved was by my side, it would be enough for a lifetime, but I no longer thought that way. Roxana didn't wait for my answer. She playfully tapped my forehead and said, If we get married, everything will be just the way you want. Okay. We're not getting married. I instinctively wanted to say it out loud, but the person on stage beat me to it. The microphone crackled with static, mixed with the emotional voice of a man, echoing through the room, deafening. Roxana, I don't want to marry her, if you're willing. We can leave right now. Everyone's eyes followed Marco's gaze. A mixture of shock, mockery, and anger pressing down on us. My heart felt like it was going to burst from the pressure. The noise around me seemed non-existent. Even breathing became difficult. Marco looked at Roxana, as if they were two lovers separated by a galaxy. Gazing at each other, he lowered his eyes, filled with affection as he looked at her. Roxana, I figured it out. I don't care about the past anymore. As long as you're willing today, we can be together. I don't want to marry anyone else. I don't want to spend my life with someone I don't love. I love you. Roxana, let's leave together. Okay. The room was in chaos, and I saw one of the elders cry out, trying to stop him. The voices of the crowd surged like a tidal wave, slowly drowning us. I looked at Roxana. Her hand was clenched tightly, as if she was struggling to hold something back. The pain in my wrist spread, but the familiar feeling of suffocation rendered me speechless. The next second, she suddenly let go. I stared blankly as she stood up and ran toward Marco. The crowd swarmed around them, but they moved closer and closer to each other. I watched as she took Marco's hand, and together, they left the sea of people. I saw the smile on Marco's lips, and the murmurs from all directions. I heard people cursing Marco for ruining the wedding, blaming Roxana, the ex, for showing up, and criticizing me for not being able to control my own girlfriend. The pressure in my chest felt like it was about to explode, but I just stood there, dumbfounded, watching them disappear. How envious I was. Roxana. Chapter 16. Roxana held Marco's hand as they left the wedding venue. People were chasing after them, but she floored the gas pedal and sped away. The car was quiet. Marco didn't say anything, but the smile on his face never faded. Roxana didn't know where she was heading. Her mind was a mess, tangled with thoughts she couldn't sort out or cut off. It wasn't until she parked that she realized she had brought Marco back home. Marco unlocked the previously locked room, and after changing his clothes, he found Roxana sitting on the sofa, smoking a cigarette. Roxana had quit smoking long ago. She stopped right after he left. The curling white smoke blurred half of her face, and while the smell of the cigarette choked Marco, it also made him feel uneasy. He walked over and hugged Roxana, trying to kiss her, but she turned her head, avoiding him. His lips barely brushed her cheek. Marco froze, but she said nothing. She picked up her phone to make a call. Marco's sharp eyes caught the name on the screen, Joseph, without thinking. He grabbed her hand, stopping her from dialing. What are you doing, Marco? Roxana frowned, her face showing a frustration he had never seen before. I'm calling my boyfriend. Marco was stunned, and the joy he had felt earlier evaporated. Roxana, he looks like me. She looked up, meeting Marco's gaze, and didn't deny it. Weren't you with him because he looks like me? You took me away. He's just a substitute. I'm back now. I'll stay by your side from now on. Roxana, I forgive you. Let's go back to how we were. Okay. Roxana looked at him, her face expressionless, the white smoke blurring half of her features. But Marco could still clearly see the coldness on the other side of her face. She said, No, Marco, I owe you. You didn't want to get married, and I stood by you. But you shouldn't have humiliated your family, your fiancé, and my boyfriend in front of everyone, because I owe you. I chose to prioritize your feelings. But Marco, her eyes were sharp and clear. I don't love you anymore. Chapter 17. Marco's emotions collapsed suddenly, like sand blown apart by the wind, but you owe me. Roxana. You owe me, and you'll never repay it in this lifetime. Roxana didn't respond, holding her phone and continuing to call, but the only reply was the mechanical voice endlessly repeating, sorry, the number you have dialed. Growing increasingly frustrated, she backed out of the call and tried to send Joseph a voice message, but there was an unread text from Joseph, sent just minutes earlier, we're breaking up. Overwhelmed by her emotions, Roxana stood up and headed for the door, determined to go back and find Joseph. But then Marco suddenly laughed. Do you really think he loves you, Roxana? He doesn't love you at all. 
A man who truly loves you would never be so generous as to let your ex-boyfriend stay under the same roof. Roxana didn't turn around and kept walking towards the door. Marco continued laughing behind her. But his laughter soon turned into tears. You made him a substitute. So how do you know that you're not someone else's substitute? Roxana abruptly turned around, striding over and grabbing Marco by the shoulders. What do you know? Marco looked at her, tears spilling out as he laughed. I'm not telling you, Roxana. I just want you to suffer. Chapter 18 Roxana couldn't get through to Joseph. HR said he had taken an extended leave. Roxana asked everyone he knew, but no one seemed to know where he had gone. For the first time, Roxana felt truly irritated. It was like trying to solve a complicated math problem. Every step was written out perfectly, but the final answer remained elusive. On the tenth day of Joseph's leave, it was raining again. When Roxana was downstairs, she happened to run into Olivia. Olivia paused when she saw her, then asked, Roxana, did you and Joseph break up? Roxana wanted to say no, but when she opened her mouth, no words came out. Olivia turned and looked out at the pouring rain. After a long silence, she finally spoke. You're a lot luckier than him. Chapter 19 There was something contradictory about Joseph. The first time Roxana met him, for a moment, she mistook him for the Marco of the past. She admitted that was what initially drew her in. But as time passed, she realized how different Joseph and Marco truly were. Joseph was always gentle with people, always smiling at everyone. But sometimes, Roxana would catch Joseph alone. And in those moments, he seemed like a soulless puppet, his face devoid of expression. Yet, the moment she called his name, it was like winding him up again, he would become animated. Even after they started dating, there wasn't much intimacy between them. When Joseph got close to her, he always seemed awkward, too restrained, and too polite. The most intimate gesture they had shared was her kissing his face. She thought he was just shy, but he always stood at a distance, staring at her in a daze. Roxana had caught that look a few times. It was like looking into an endless expanse of snow. There was too much going on in his eyes. Too many complex emotions. The only thing she could clearly make out was the overwhelming love that came crashing down like an avalanche. She thought he loved her. What she didn't realize was that they were both liars. She knew nothing about his past. For instance, his usual indifference, the way he avoided talking about his family, or the crisscrossing scars on his body. All these obvious red flags. She had no clue. Chapter 20 Two days before Joseph's leave was about to end, Roxana went to the cemetery Olivia had mentioned. When the staff at the entrance saw her, there was a moment of blankness on their face, and they blurted out a name, Alicia. Roxana frowned. The middle-aged man scratched his head, apologetic, sorry, you must be here to visit her, right? Twins, I assume. Roxana didn't answer, instead asking him, why do you remember her? He smiled, I've been working here for three years, there's a guy who comes here every week rain or shine, never missed a single visit, out of curiosity, he had once looked up who he was visiting, a girl in her twenties, she had dimples when she smiled, and that stuck with him, Roxana's expression darkened, she found out where Alicia's grave was and walked towards it, the wind howled through the cemetery, there was someone standing in front of Alicia's grave, Joseph's figure was thin, and he seemed frail, amidst all the tombstones, he looked like a living monument, she called out, Joseph, chapter 21, when I turned around, the glaring light made the figure in front of me blur for a moment. It almost made me think it was her. Thinking about it now, it's kind of funny. The dead don't come back to life. That's a simple fact. When I realized it was Roxana, I was a bit surprised. Roxana was always composed, always smiling when she faced me. Her dimples uncannily like Alicia's. But this time, she wasn't smiling. Her gaze fell on the black and white photo behind me. It took her a long time to finally speak. Her voice strained like a slow moving stream. Joseph. Every time you look at me, what are you thinking about? What am I thinking about? Every time I peered through the crack of a door at Roxana, every time I spaced out looking at her profile, I was using her to recreate my Alicia. If she hadn't died, if she were still alive, what would it be like? Chapter 22 I grew up in the narrow alleys of the slums. My childhood was filled with the sound of adults gossiping in a mix of curses, the stench of rotting sewage, flies everywhere, and an alcoholic father and an indifferent mother. Life and death didn't have clear boundaries for me. When my father and mother beat me until I was nearly unconscious, I heard my mother stop him, saying, don't really kill him. What I thought was, it would be better if I were dead. It's strange. They were afraid of others finding out, so they never left marks where my clothes couldn't cover them. But as I grew older, they weren't satisfied with only abusing me at home. They needed to assert their dominance in public too. They beat and scolded me in front of others, stripping away any dignity I had. It felt like I was born to repay their debts, but it didn't matter, because I got used to it. When I was 15, 
I stood at the edge of the fifth floor balcony of my school, looking down, the wind howling in my ears. For a moment, I thought, maybe I should just jump. Then Alicia appeared. Someone grabbed my wrist and yanked me back. We both ended up falling to the ground, and the rough surface scraped two gashes on Alicia's hand, but I was unharmed, safe in her embrace. When she let go, she sighed in relief and scolded me, don't do anything stupid, but when she looked into my eyes, she fell silent, an inappropriate blush spreading across her face, Joseph, why is it you? You know me. Who doesn't know the top student? Her voice softened, why were you standing on the, I didn't answer, just got up and walked away, she called after me, but I didn't turn back, I didn't know how to interact with people, preferring to be alone, Alicia, though was like an NPC in a role-playing game, one you can't get rid of until you finish their quest. After that day, she started seeking me out. I wasn't used to socializing, but I didn't hate it either. It was just that, after years of experiences, I had learned to avoid people by instinct. But Alicia kept showing up on my quest log, and eventually became a daily task. Chapter 23 My father happened to return just as I was on my way back from school. He reeked of alcohol and came toward me raising his hand high before slapping me hard across the face. People at the alley's entrance were used to the sight. They glanced over, whispered for a moment, then moved on to the next piece of gossip. I lowered my eyes, and he cursed at me, just looking at you pisses me off. After his outburst, he stumbled away, not even caring about me. My face throbbed painfully, a burning sensation spreading across my skin. When I looked up, my eyes met Alicia's in the crowd. She stood there, looking stunned raising the book in her hand as if she was about to call out to me. But the moment she saw my face, she stopped herself. She took me to her house. It was just her and her grandmother there. Alicia dampened a towel and placed it over my face, asking, who did this? My dad. She was silent for a moment, her words coming out with difficulty. Does he do this to you often? I didn't answer. Her eyes fell on the long sleeves I was wearing. I zipped up my jacket. Don't ask. There was a moment of suffocating silence. I could almost hear Alicia's heartbeat erratic and disordered. After a long time, she suddenly grabbed my hand. She said, Joseph, let's run away together. After we finish the college entrance exams, we'll apply to a university far away from home. Let's escape this miserable place. The cramped courtyard was filled with the damp smell of mildew, mixed with the nauseating stench of cigarettes and alcohol from outside. The setting sun fell on Alicia's shoulders. Her smile was a little forced, her dimples barely visible. I held the towel against my face and responded, okay. Chapter 24, Alicia would walk with me to and from school, using the excuse that I was helping her study so she could take me to her house, her grandmother would make me something delicious to eat, Alicia was smart, but her heart wasn't in her studies, I pushed her, and over time, her grades started to improve, eventually, we both took the college entrance exams, on the day the results were released, Alicia was so excited that she dragged me all over the city, running through the streets and alleys, Joseph, second place in the entire province, now you can go wherever you want. We bought a small cake, and the candlelight reflected in her eyes, like burning flames. It made my heart feel like it was on fire. Where do you want to go? I haven't decided yet. Take your time thinking. When you decide, let me know. I'll go with you. Alicia was like a fire. Whenever I got close to her, I felt warm. At times, I would even have the illusion that I was being ignited as well. But before that fire could fully catch, it was extinguished. A provincial news outlet wanted to interview me, but I refused. Maybe it was because, on that day, my drunken father publicly cursed me out, and Alicia saw it. She didn't look for me after that, instead wandering through the neighborhood. The life I had lived under the cold stares of others for years became the fodder for attention-grabbing stories. They exaggerated, cursing my parents and painting my life as tragic. Then, after being embellished, it became the topic of conversation at people's dinner tables. The story caused a sensation. More media outlets came sniffing around. They invaded every aspect of my life. And suddenly, everyone was pointing at me, saying, that's the poor kid. His parents treated him horribly, but he still did so well in school. You should be more like him. My parents couldn't stand the public scrutiny. It seemed like they were finally getting their comeuppance, being insulted by others and punished at their workplaces. But scum doesn't repent. So, in the end, all the consequences fell back on me. Worse than before, when they threw me out, it was on a rainy day. My father screamed, ungrateful brat, get out. And don't come back. The neighbors whispered, forming a circle to watch the spectacle, but no one offered to help. Eighteen years of pain had piled up, reaching a tipping point, breaking the last line of defense in my heart, and then Alicia appeared. Without hesitation, she pushed through the crowd and grabbed my hand. Joseph, it's okay, I'll take you away. Don't be afraid, Joseph, I'm here. Chapter 25 I got sick, 
Alicia took me back to her house. There were only two rooms in her home. She gave me hers and slept with her grandmother every night. I locked myself in the room, pulling the heavy curtains closed and curling up in the darkness. The old scars on my body felt like worms crawling under my skin, gnawing at my nerves. I couldn't bear any light. Sometimes, I would lose control. I'd scratch my arms with sharp nails until they bled, only regaining my senses once I saw the blood, as if someone trapped in a nightmare had suddenly woken up. I had no idea what I had just done. Alicia would fumble in the dark to apply medicine to my wounds. Sometimes I stayed quiet, letting her tend to me without resistance. Other times, I'd lose control, swatting the medicine out of her hands and tearing off the newly formed scabs. The blood that had just clotted would start flowing again. In the pitch black room, the only light came from the faint glow in Alicia's eyes. She suddenly rushed over and held me tightly in her arms. I was trapped in her embrace. I wanted to fight back but feared hurting her. I couldn't feel the pain, so I bit down hard on her shoulder. Alicia didn't say a word, just held me, until the madness passed. The room fell into a suffocating silence. Alicia. I. Joseph. She interrupted me. Her head was buried in my neck, and her hands trembled slightly. I felt the wetness on my collar, like falling sparks, scorching me. It's okay. It's okay. She kept repeating it. I didn't know if she was comforting me or herself. You're just sick. It's like having a cold. If we go to the hospital, take the medicine, and follow the doctor's advice, you'll get better you will definitely get better. In the pitch black room, the smell of blood mixed with the lavender scented detergent from Alicia's clothes and the faint smell of dust hanging in the air. The body leaning against me was heavy and hot, so close that I could feel the steady beating of her heart in her chest. It was strange. When my parents beat me until I couldn't even make a sound, I didn't cry. When they slapped me in front of my classmates at school, I didn't cry. When everyone pointed and whispered about me, when I was kicked out of the house, I didn't cry. But the warm liquid running down my face told me clearly. I was crying. My tears tasted salty. Instinctively, I wanted to wipe them away. But Alicia hugged me even tighter. The sound of heartbeats pounded in my ears. Not just hers. I closed my eyes and wrapped my arms around her waist. I said, yes, I'm just sick. Chapter 26. The first time Alicia took me to the hospital, she was fully covered, trying to hide her identity. But I still had an episode on the way. She shielded me from most of the stairs and spoke to me gently. Joseph, I'm here. Don't be afraid. Joseph. When I came back to my senses, I met her gaze. Her almond-shaped eyes were a bit moist. Not from embarrassment, but from pity. I immediately calmed down. The doctor said I needed to be hospitalized, but we didn't have that kind of money. So, he gave me a prescription instead. Antidepressants weren't cheap. It was a long and dreary summer. Alicia left early every day for part-time jobs, making sure I took my medicine and scheduling appointments with a therapist for me. She got much darker from all the time spent working in the sun but her eyes still sparkled. I could go outside now, but I was still afraid of crowded places. One evening, when Alicia came home, she found me in the yard, helping her grandmother pick vegetables. Joseph, did you take your medicine today? When she smiled, it was as if she glowed. I washed my hands. I did. Oh, and a teacher from a tutoring center came by. They want me to tutor some students. She paused for a moment. You, I agreed. A second place student tutoring others, they offered me a good rate. I'm just sick. Alicia, I'll recover. She seemed like a clock that had slowed down, and after a long moment, she smiled, her dimples showing. Yes, Joseph, you'll get better. Chapter 27 By the end of the summer break, my condition was mostly under control. Alicia didn't go out to work as much anymore. She had saved up some money and was thinking about starting a small business. Alicia's grades were good enough to get into a top-tier 985 university, but she insisted on applying to the same school as me. Once we were in college, we met up every weekend, spending four yuan to take a two-hour bus ride. Time always seemed to fly when we were together. Later, I didn't need to take medication anymore. Alicia would come to visit me. My roommates occasionally teased me about her. When she was waiting for me at the school gate, one of them walked over to joke with her. Hey, classmate, who are you to our Joseph? Alicia was taken aback, a slight blush rising to her ears. I stood by, watching her, feeling a strange urge to laugh. She opened her mouth and after a moment of hesitation, answered awkwardly, Sister, I'm his sister. My roommate lost interest, but I stood there, stunned, feeling as though my heart had skipped a beat. I was always a quick learner, with a better memory than most, always able to solve problems my peers couldn't, but there were many things I didn't understand. No one ever told me why. Even though I avoided Alicia at first, I felt happy every time she smiled at me. Why? Even when I didn't feel sad, I would still shed tears. Why? I couldn't figure it out. Alicia hadn't walked far before she noticed something was off with me and asked, what's wrong? I stopped, 
looked at her, and asked directly, Why did you lie? She froze for a second, then smiled. Her expression tinged with innocent mischief, Aren't we family? I'm younger than you by a month, so you're technically my older brother. The word hit me hard, leaving me dazed. I slowly chewed on the meaning of that word, family. Isn't that what we are? Alicia's face was a bit flushed, but her voice was firm. We live together. Grandma likes you, and I like you too. Don't you like me? Like us? I do. I looked into her eyes. I answered earnestly. I liked Grandma, and I liked Alicia. I liked that Grandma made pumpkin cakes for me, called me a good kid, said I was too skinny, and told me to eat more. I liked that Alicia's eyes lit up when she called me by my name, that she told me she was always there for me, that she said, we're family, not parents who only yelled at me or hit me, but them, people who smiled gently at me, even though we weren't related by blood. We're family, Alicia. You're a very, very important part of my family. Alicia froze for a moment, a brief flash of defeat crossing her face, but it quickly disappeared. She lightly touched my shoulder. You are too, Joseph. At that time, I believed her, and for years after, I often thought, if I had understood earlier, if I had realized sooner what Alicia's blush meant, if I had told her back then, that my feelings for her were more than just familial, maybe then, we would have had fewer regrets. Chapter 28, and then what? Olivia opened another bottle of wine, hesitating as she asked, and then, I stood up, knocking over a bottle on the floor, stepping on the scattered cap, I have a good memory, and I remember everything clearly, except for that particular time, like a ruler with its markings deliberately erased, I didn't look at him, my gaze fell on the not yet dawned sky outside the window, after a long pause, I responded with something entirely unrelated, do you remember, that news from five years ago, right before the new year, a car crashed into pedestrians, killing six and injuring twelve. Olivia froze for a moment, reaching for her phone to look it up. I closed my eyes. The deliberately forgotten memories came flooding back. The speeding car, the deafening crash, the people scattering, and the pain of being shoved hard in the waist. Then came the sudden screams and cries. Someone rushed forward, hugging a child lying motionless on the street. Someone else frantically ran into the middle of the road, and everything froze around that growing pool of blood. Alicia bled so much. Could a person's body really contain that much blood? I didn't know. Time accelerated. The ambulance came. She was taken into surgery. The light on the operating room door turned on, then off, over and over again. I lost count of how many times they wheeled her in. All I remembered was that the lights in the hospital hallway were dim. It was cold at night. I kept counting the tiles in that hallway, from one end to the other, then back again. Sometimes I counted more, sometimes fewer. By the end, I couldn't keep track. When the light went out for the last time, the doctor came out and shook her head at me. She said, you can say your final goodbyes. When I entered, Alicia's eyes were half open, looking toward the door. The respirator covered most of her face, and the smell of blood was overwhelming. When she saw me, she seemed like she wanted to smile, but even lifting her eyes seemed difficult. That's when I realized how much paler she had become. Gentle and quiet, like a sickly princess from a European fairy tale. Alicia moved her lips, but no sound came out. I took off her respirator. She fell silent again. She tried to lift her hand, but it trembled. I knelt beside her bed, resting my head against the edge. Alicia raised her hand, slowly, gently, carefully, resting it on my brow. It felt like she was stroking a precious piece of silk, or perhaps trying to carve something into my bones. Her fingers traced along my brow, inch by inch, following the curve of my face. It tickled slightly. I didn't cry. I just looked at her. Alicia looked at me too her eyes squinting slightly as if she wanted to smile, or maybe to see me more clearly. After a long time, I finally heard her call my name, Joseph. I obediently responded. Her words came out slowly, each one taking effort, as if she were chewing on shards of glass. You have to live well, live well. But what does it mean to live well? I didn't know. So I asked her. Alicia paused. It's, I must have asked a question too abrupt, one she hadn't fully considered. Um, study hard, get your diploma find a job you like, she hesitated, as if something was stuck in her throat, and when she spoke again, it was with difficulty, fall in love, get, slowly grow old, I didn't say anything, she, however, became more insistent, don't stay up late, go to the hospital when you're sick, don't, by the end, her voice grew quieter and quieter, Joseph, I looked at her, Alicia looked at me, her gaze fluctuating, like the stormy sea under a dark night sky, waves crashing, but they were stopped short by her serene expression. At the very end, her fingers stopped at the center of my brow. She said, make sure you eat well, Joseph. Chapter 29. Later, I did everything she told me to do. I studied, graduated, and found a good job. I met Roxana. 
She confessed her feelings to me, and we started dating. I don't stay up late, although I often lie awake until the middle of the night, unable to sleep. I eat properly now, no longer picky about food. I've followed everything you told me to do, Alicia, but why? Why am I still not happy? Chapter 30 Roxana wanted an answer, but I couldn't give her one. Aren't we the same? Did you forget? When we weren't even dating, you got drunk, and I took you home. You called me Marco. We do look pretty similar, don't we? Marco told me. A substitute will never measure up to the real thing. Roxana, don't you feel the same way? Roxana opened her mouth, as if to say something, but after a long pause, no words came out. Marco came back, and you resolved your issues with him by running away from the wedding. A happy, perfect ending where you two finally reunite, wouldn't that be great? I stood above her, looking down, so why are you still coming to find me? She said, it's not like that, I took him away because I felt guilty, I've already, already, are you going to say you've fallen in love with me? I interrupted her, Roxana fell silent, is this what love looks like? I asked her, is love ignoring me on a rainy day to make him ginger tea, leaving a sick person to spend time with your ex, abandoning your current boyfriend at a wedding, letting him bear the scorn and gossip of the guests alone, Roxana, you tell me, is that love? Chapter 31, she couldn't answer, Chapter 32, when I went to the office on Tuesday, Olivia asked me where I had been and why I had taken such a long leave, grandma caught a cold, so I stayed with her for a few extra days, Olivia patted my shoulder, You've got a lot of work piled up from your time off. Let me know if you need help. I smiled and waved the papers in my hand. No need. I'm quitting. Coincidentally, Anna had recently offered me a new opportunity, so I took it. She offered me a great deal. Grandma is getting old, and there are more and more things that require money. I resigned in the morning. Roxana came looking for me in the afternoon. Olivia had just dropped me off at my new apartment when we ran into her. When Roxana saw me, her eyes flickered, and she irritably stubbed out her cigarette. Why did you quit? Having your ex-girlfriend as your boss can be awkward. Roxana let out a short laugh. She'd been in the business world for a long time. Always calm and composed. Even in moments of panic, she could quickly adjust, becoming the confident Roxana everyone knew. Really? Is it that awkward? Joseph. She met my gaze directly, not dodging, just as composed as ever. Of course, it wouldn't be awkward, because I didn't care. I just didn't want to see her face, the one that looked 80% like Alicia's, anymore. I lowered my eyes and ignored her. I reached for my keys to unlock the door, but Roxana suddenly hugged me from behind. The scent of lilies mixed with cigarette smoke surrounding me in a way that brooked no argument. Roxana buried her face in my back. Her voice was gentle. Joseph, she's just your past. No matter how much we look alike, the only person standing in front of you now is me. I admit, I initially confessed to you because you reminded me of Marco, but over time, I realized how different you are from him. What I love is you. Her voice softened coaxing me, trying to persuade, if you're upset because of him, I won't talk to him anymore, if you ask, I'll do it, don't be mad at me, alright, Roxana's breath was uneven, it brushed against my ear, making it burn, I didn't say anything, I pulled away from her embrace, but Roxana wouldn't let go, and our eyes met, Roxana didn't know, before I turned 18, I didn't have a heart, then Alicia appeared, love took root, it sprouted from my heart, and my lifeless body began to grow flesh, then she left, and my heart was empty again. I stared at the dimples at the corners of Roxana's mouth. My voice calm. Roxana, you're really nothing compared to her. Chapter 33. Roxana didn't get angry, but her face suddenly turned ashen. I didn't acknowledge her and simply opened the door and went inside the house. The next day, she wasn't at the door anymore, but the ground was littered with cigarette ash. I started working at Anna's company, and my life became quite ordinary. Roxana often came to Anna's office. I could feel her gaze on me but I pretended not to notice. One day, after finishing a work report, Anna suddenly called out to me. She pushed a beautifully wrapped gift box in my direction. I frowned slightly. It's from Roxana. Anna cleared her throat. She went abroad for a business trip recently. She said she came across it at an auction. This watch suits you. The lid of the box was opened, revealing the shimmering watch face inside. The brilliance of it was striking. Clearly expensive. I didn't move. Anna smiled faintly. She had the lock on that room at home removed not too long ago. She and Marco are completely done, she said. A mess. Lynn. I interrupted her. She didn't continue, you don't want to hear it, so I won't say more, but she's not giving up easily. Joseph. It seems like she's serious this time. Chapter 34. As I was leaving, I ran into Roxana. Her gaze shifted from my hands to my neck. When she realized there was nothing, her eyes dimmed. Our eyes met for a brief moment, and just as she was about to speak, Joseph. I turned away first and walked off quickly. That day. 
I ran into two people I didn't want to see. Marco was waiting for me outside after work. His face was haggard. Gone was the arrogance from when I first met him. Joseph. He called out to me. I stopped in front of him and asked, What do you want? His eyes drifted to my wrist, and he murmured as if in a dream, She didn't give it to you. She said the watch was beautiful, that she wanted to buy it to apologize to you. We fought so many times. She said she loves you, that she only wants to marry you. She cleaned out that room, said she wanted to cut ties with me, and I told her you don't love her. Do you know what she said? Marco suddenly became agitated, stepping forward and grabbing my shoulders. She said she didn't care. Joseph, do you know? She said as long as she loves you, that's enough. I looked at Marco's distorted expression, feeling no ripple of emotion inside. He gripped tightly, his nails nearly digging into my flesh. I pried his fingers off, one by one. You're wrong. She doesn't love me. She loves what she can't have. It used to be you, now it's me. Chapter 35 Anna was a great boss, and after that day, Roxana showed up less often, but her efforts never ceased. It was as if she had belatedly started pursuing me, using all kinds of gifts to win me over. I returned everything to Anna. Anna said she had tried to talk to Roxana, but Roxana wouldn't give up. Things you can't have easily become obsessions, especially for someone like Roxana. The longer she's stuck, the more likely she'll go mad. My words proved prophetic. Anna called me late one night. I often struggled with insomnia. When the call came, I hadn't fallen asleep yet, and the first thing I heard was her voice. Joseph, I'm at a bar with Roxana right now. She's had too much to drink and is acting out. We can't control her. Can you come over? Why not call Marco? We did, but it didn't help. I was silent for a moment, then asked her, Is this an order from my boss? Anna hesitated, then sighed softly, Sorry, this is the last time, I promise. From now on, I'll stop her from bothering you, I said. All right. Chapter 36 By the time I arrived at the bar, it was already 3 a.m. The private room reeked of alcohol. Strong liquor had spilled all over the floor, and bottles were scattered everywhere. Anna was trying to stop Roxana from drinking more, with another friend also attempting to calm her down. The moment I opened the door, Roxana instantly got up from the couch, stumbling toward me. The smell of alcohol clung to her as she fell into my arms. Roxana's head slumped heavily on my shoulder. This time, she didn't get my name wrong. Joseph. Her voice was hoarse. She kept calling my name over and over, as if trying to confirm if this was a dream or reality. I responded with a simple yes. Immediately, she seemed delighted hugging my waist and nuzzling her face against mine. After a while, she finally spoke. What kind of person was she? I knew she was asking about Alicia, but I didn't want to answer. When I didn't respond, Roxana let go and looked at me. Her eyes were slightly red, and for the first time, I saw something resembling brokenness on the face of someone who had spent years navigating the world of business. It's not about what you can't have. I didn't catch what she said clearly. Roxana raised her eyes to look at me. She asked again, Alicia, what kind of person was she? I remained silent. She suddenly grabbed my hand. I'm just like her, right? I know you like this face. It's okay. It's okay. She had drunk too much. Her words were jumbled. I wasn't sure if she was speaking to me or to herself. As long as you like this face, tell me, what kind of person was she, Joseph? It doesn't matter if I'm just a stand-in. As long as you stay by my side. She locked eyes with mine, speaking seriously, stubbornly. Her gaze was like shattered glass. I'm begging you, Joseph. It's okay to be a stand-in. Just let me stay with you. I remained silent and pushed her away. Roxana's face, already pale and sickly, lost its last trace of color. She tried to grab my hand again, but I stepped back. I was wrong. Roxana, you're nothing like her. Anna asked me to come here, and I did. She said this would be the last time. Roxana, if you don't want me to feel disgusted and repulsed every time I see you, then stop doing this. Okay. Roxana's face was ashen, and her body was trembling. Sensing something was wrong, I was about to call for Anna when Roxana suddenly collapsed. Unsteady on her feet, I didn't look back. She called out to me from behind, her voice weak and pained. Joseph. Anna came in, calling for an ambulance while trying to support Roxana, and I turned and walked out, without looking back. Chapter 37. Anna told me that Roxana was hospitalized. Over the phone, she hesitated, then sighed and said, She still wants to see you. I told her that if she doesn't want you to hate her, she should stop clinging to you. I didn't respond. Anna apologized again. Sorry. I promise I won't let her bother you anymore. The wind howled through the cemetery. I laid down the flowers I had brought for Alicia. The girl in her twenty smiled in the photo. That picture was taken when I was standing right in front of her. And if you looked closely, you could faintly see my reflection in her eyes. Anna was still saying something on the phone. I didn't take in a single word. Only at the end did I hear her hesitantly ask. If. 
And I mean if, if she hadn't lied to you from the start and genuinely wanted to be with you, would things be different now? I could hear the breathing on the other end of the line. Another person's breathing was more labored. No, I answered. The call ended. Everything suddenly became quiet. Living well doesn't necessarily mean you have to fall in love, right? No one answered me. The girl in the photo only smiled with understanding. The sky was clear, the clouds high. I lowered my gaze. Alicia, I miss you. Grandma misses you too. I took time off to go home. On the day Grandma recovered from her illness, she made me pumpkin cakes. I sat in the yard, helping pick vegetables. The sunlight outside was warm, falling softly on my body. Grandma fanned herself lazily with a palm fan. Everything was perfect, except for one person missing. It's been five years since Alicia passed. Grandma often urged me to bring a girlfriend home. How can you find a girlfriend if you keep running to grandma's house during breaks? Her hair was white, but she was as kind as ever, smiling as she called me her good boy. I brushed it off with a laugh. She lightly tapped my head with her fan. Then she got up to fetch the pumpkin cakes from the kitchen. When I looked up, I caught sight of the sun. The light was blinding. Sometimes, after that high fever, I would dream of Alicia, 16 or 17-year-old Alicia, holding her homework and asking me how to solve a problem. Walking home with me after evening classes, grabbing my hand and saying she wanted to run away with me. When she smiled, she was like the sun, so dazzling. But in the end, it was always the 21-year-old Alicia, lying pale on a hospital bed, tracing my face over and over with her fingers, repeating again and again, telling me to live well. Alicia, you forgot, it was because I met you, that my life got better. I snapped out of my brief days. Grandma called me from inside the house. I wiped the tears from the corner of my eyes and walked in, as if I had never cried. A lifetime is long, very long. The next few decades are just a drawn-out sentence. The cold moon and warm sun, slowly wearing away at life. 